Well, our brother Lee prayed a few moments ago in thanksgiving for every member of the congregation here, for every member that was here. And I'm thankful that he did. Sometimes in extending our welcome to our visitors, we overlook our members. But we are grateful for every member of the congregation here that is present this morning. We're thankful for every visitor that we might have on this occasion. I want to encourage everyone to please come back tonight at 5 o'clock. We'll be meeting to study once again from God's holy and inspired word. We're going back to the series that we began two weeks ago, A Woman's Place. And we'll begin this morning with this question, why this study? Am I a glutton for punishment? Do I just simply want problems? Well, when we talk about a woman's place, I'll have to say this. I was so impressed with how our ladies received that first lesson, how they responded to it. I was only hung in effigy four times I only received two death threats. Since one of them was from Julie, I won't even count one of them. But seriously, from the ladies, I received more encouragement than anyone else. And so a woman's place, why this study? Well, have you looked at our society? Have you really taken a look at what's going on in our nation? Things are changing in this nation at breakneck speed and not for the good. To be politically correct, we are redefining family. Family can be anything you want it to be. And to accommodate the ungodly, we of course are restructuring marriage. Now I'm talking about society, we can never really do that. God has already structured, designed marriage. It'll never change. But in the minds of many people, that's what they're trying to do. They're restructuring marriage. Let me state this. When we look at this series, A Woman's Place, a woman's place is not with another woman. It never has been. It never will be. A man's place is not with another man. That is not God's plan. Again, it never has been, nor will it ever be. In fact, it's only the most carnal, the most confused philosophies that tell us that a woman's place is with another woman, that a man's place is with another man. When you look through the Bible seriously and honestly, A woman with another woman or a man with another man, it's unnatural. Romans 1, verses 26 and 27. It is unrighteous. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. It is unholy. It is ungodly, according to Leviticus 18 and verse 22 and chapter 20 and verse 13. It's an abomination before God. And so a woman's place, why this study? Because we need it desperately, not so much here within the body, but within our society. We need to be prepared to help others understand what is God's plan? What is his place for man, for woman? Go back to three verses in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 7 and verse 31, in Jeremiah 19 and verse 5, and in Jeremiah 32 and verse 35, God says concerning passing their children through the fire of Molech. God says, I did not command this, nor did it ever enter my mind. And I think the same thing can be said when we see the perversion going on in this nation around the world. God looks at that and he says, I never commanded that, nor did it ever enter my mind. How low man can go. In fact, it's because of things like this in Romans, the first chapter, that God says, I gave them up. I gave them up to a depraved mind. A woman's place. Well, let's do this. Very quickly, we're going to just 
mention what we've looked at thus far. Three important observations. Keep this in mind. We're not using the term woman in a derogatory sense. Secondly, this lesson is not designed to, quote, put her in her place. And third, this study will show the wonder of God's wisdom and the preciousness of his plan. We'll never find our place until we know our purpose. Here's the problem in our society. We have no clue what we're doing here as a people. We don't know why we're here. And so since we do not know our purpose, no, I'm not surprised that we don't know our place. Our purpose is very straightforwardly set forth in the scriptures. Our purpose is to fear God and to keep his commandments. When that's what we want to pursue more than anything else, we will look to our God, we'll search his scriptures, we'll know our place because we understand our purpose. Notice this, the world's answer for this question, a woman's place. A woman's place is in the kitchen. We mentioned that last week. A woman's place, they say, is in the bedroom. That's as far as their mind goes. A woman's place is in the laundry room. Just do the dishes, do the laundry. Well, again, think about this. God's inspired answer. A woman's place is behind. This is where we began the series. This term behind, yes, we did explore what the Bible has to say about subjection, submission. We cannot, will not apologize for that. Because it's still true. This is still how the home is going to function at its best and be the happiest for all concerned. A woman's place is behind. But that doesn't tell the whole story. That's just part of the story. If we're really concerned about the whole counsel of God, Acts 20 and verse 27, we don't stop here. A woman's place is behind. A woman's place is beside. That's where we'll focus this morning. And we'll also look at a woman's place is before. If we take all three of these and understand them biblically, then we can say this right here is a woman's place. Yes, it is behind. Yes, it is beside. And yes, it is before. Well, look at this. Beside. Here's what we plan to do for just a moment. We're going to look at a single context that context, the one that Tom read a moment ago, Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24. And we're going to look at a single example, that being Aquila and Priscilla. If you're serious about finding out what's the woman's place and serious about understanding what do we mean when we say beside, then it leads us to Genesis 2. And a beautiful example. You want a hero some heroes for marriage, yes, even today, Aquila and Priscilla. These two shine as a beacon. And I'm so thankful that even here at Centerville Road, we have some like Priscilla and Aquila. We have couples that you can look to, and you can see their marriage is strong, their marriage is vibrant, their marriage is built upon the solid foundation of God and His Word. Well, let's go, if we will, to Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24. We're going to have some questions, and we're going to seek Bible answers. Be turning with me, if you will. Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24. What we're going to do is we're simply going to ask these questions and allow Scripture to answer them. A woman's place. Where is it? What is it? Well, the one who originated marriage, the one who formed man, the one who created woman. Let's let him tell us what the woman's place is. The first question. In Genesis 2 and verse 18, what did God say for the first time? Now, I'm going to read this verse up to a point. But I think you already know, what did God say here for the first time? Genesis 2, in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good. Stop there. 
For the first time, we hear God saying, it is not good. Do you know what is conspicuous about that statement? In Genesis 1, seven times, God has already said, it is good. It is good. In fact, in the last time, Genesis 1 and verse 31, when he looks at everything that he's made, he said, it is very good. Well, as you're reading Genesis 1 and you keep hearing that, it is good, it is good, it is good. This catches your attention. For the first time now, God says it's not good. Well, that leads us to the second question. What did God say this about? Well, go back with me to Genesis 2. And verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good, notice this, that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So what he said this about was man's aloneness. See, God made us to be social creatures. The greatest example we have, Jesus our Lord, Luke 2 and verse 52, he increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and in favor with men. Notice that he increased in wisdom intellectually. He increased in stature physically. He increased in favor with God spiritually. And he increased in favor with men socially. Jesus was social when he came. That's part of what got him in trouble, wasn't it? The Pharisees... The separatists, they wouldn't have anything to do with anyone else. But Jesus would eat with sinners. He would receive them because he was calling them to repentance. But again, what did God say this about our aloneness? It's not good for man to be alone. Look at question three. It says in Genesis 2.19, what did God bring unto Adam? Keep that question in mind. What was the state of purpose for this parade? And in Genesis 2.20, what was the outcome of this incident? Read this with me. Genesis 2, verses 19 and verse 20. It says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam. Keep that phrase in mind. He brought them, the animals, to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So having read this, look look at this. In Genesis 2.19, what did God bring into Adam? He brought him all the animals. He brought them to him. What was the state of purpose for this parade? Well, Adam was going to name them. Whatever name he gave them, that was its name. In Genesis 2.20, what was the outcome of this incident? Adam learns. Now keep this in mind. God already knew. God already stated it's not good for man to be alone. Obviously, Adam had not come to that conclusion yet. But now this helps him. He sees all the animals. He sees that they have a counterpart. In looking at every living creature, he realizes, I don't have anything comparable. He is now at the point that God has already been. It's not good for me to be alone. This is what God wants to impress upon the mind of Adam. Now notice this. Question 4. In Genesis 2.21, what did God take from Adam? In Genesis 2.22, what did God make from his rib? Now, if you're a student, you love questions like this because the second question answers the first one. You ever notice that when your teacher gives you a test? And if you just read down far enough, you'll probably get the answer to some of those. But... Genesis 2, 21, what did God take from Adam? Well, we've already mentioned. He took a rib. We'll read verse 21 in a moment. In Genesis 2, 22, what did God make from this rib, from Adam's rib? Read with me verses 21 and 22. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. 
And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Now, do you remember the phrase I ask you to remember? In verse 19, every beast of the field, every bird of the air, the Bible says in verse 19, and brought them to Adam. Previously, God had brought them, the animals, to Adam. Now he's bringing something else to Adam. It's not those animals. He's going to bring his new creation. He's going to bring what he has formed from that rib. And so think about this next question. From Genesis 2, 22, what did God now bring to Adam? He brought Eve. He brought Adam's wife. He brought the mother of all living. And so again, the parade, what was it for? So Adam could name each creature, but an implied reason, so Adam could feel his own aloneness. So he would recognize, I don't have a help me. This is not good for me. Well, look at the next question. Question number six. In Genesis 2, 23, what was Adam's response and what can we deduce from his words? Look at his response. In verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's his response. Adam gets it. Adam understands this one is corresponding to me. This one is my help me. This is bone of my bone. Adam says, Lord, I know what you did with my rib. I see it. This, Eve. Again, my wife, she is bone of my bone. She is flesh of my flesh. I'll call her. Remember, he's already named all the animals. I'll call her woman, womb man, for she was taken from man. Adam, men, is excited about this. We read this so many times, we put no inflection into it. We have no excitement when we read it. Try to put yourself in Adam's place. He's feeling his aloneness. He understands that he doesn't have one comparable. God remedies that situation. He takes what was not good and makes it great. And Adam says this. This is what I'm talking about. This is now bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. Oh, he's thankful. He's elated. He is excited. As we should be still today. Regarding our wives. Again, Think about number seven. What three laws governing marriage are seen in Genesis 2, 24? Let me just read this and suggest these three laws. But it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The three laws, first, the law of permanence. Adam has left father and mother. That's the relationship that he was used to. That's the only relationship he's ever known. But he understands now I'm going to leave that relationship. Why? For a deeper relationship. For a stronger relationship. Again, permanence. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19 and verse 6. Permanence. And so leave father and mother. It goes on to say, and be joined or cleave to his wife. Here's commitment we're going to be joined together God has joined us together remember Philippians 4 in verse 2 I know this is not talking about husband and wife it's talking about two sisters that are not getting along but the principle is there I urge Yodius and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord be committed to one another love one another care for one another again to husbands and wives, I urge husbands and I urge wives to live in harmony. This relationship you've just entered, marriage, 
It is not disposable. It is permanent. The permanence of that relationship should ensure commitment. I am going to be committed to this one because I said, till death do we part. This is God's permanent arrangement. And notice the next thought here. Be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Here is intimacy. Permanence, commitment, intimacy. The two becomes one flesh. When the intimacy of Genesis 2 and verse 24 is based upon permanence and based upon commitment. It's what God intends. It's what God has always said, this is good. You know, when God says it is good, it's very good, the sexual relationship between man and woman was implied in that. Again, go back and read Genesis 1. He formed male and female. He created them. This was all good. This is God's plan. And so when we enter marriage based upon permanence, when we're committed to one another, becoming one flesh is what God's plan is. Now let me read something from Matthew Henry. In his commentary, he has a great thought concerning this context. And again, it helps us look at what we've just seen. Where is woman's place? It is beside man. Matthew Henry says this, he says, if man is the head, she is the crown. A crown to her husband, the crown of all visible creation. Then he goes on to say this. She was not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. A woman's place, it's beside her husband. Not over him, not under him, it's beside him to be an equal. Does that contradict what we said two weeks ago? Not at all. Not at all. Any wise Bible student, any wise husband, any wise wife understands that, yes, the Bible teaches me to be in subjection. But once again, that subjection does not imply slavery, inferiority. It doesn't imply that you lose your identity. You have been created to be your husband's helpmeet. He needs you. Again, you are his equal. Fellow heir of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. And so again... Let me read this. It's entitled Marriage, 1,700 Years Ago. What a story it tells. I wish we had this kind of concept towards marriage today. And this was not written by a Christian. Listen to this. It says, Beautiful is the marriage of Christians who are one in hope, one in the way of life they follow, one in the religion they practice. They are both servants of the same master. Nothing divides them, either in flesh or in spirit. They are two in one flesh. And where there is one flesh, there is also one spirit. They pray together. They worship together, instructing one another, strengthening one another. Side by side, they visit God's church. Side by side, they face difficulties and persecutions, share their consolations. They have no secrets from one another. They never bring sorrow to each other's heart unembarrassed they visit the sick and assist the needy they give alms without anxiety psalms and hymns are sung hearing and seeing this christ rejoices to such as these he gives his peace where there are two together there also he is present and where he is there evil is not that was written in the third century have we progressed now we've gone backwards our view, our concept of marriage is so dismal today in our society. The Bible still says marriage is honorable in all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled for adulterers and whoremongers. God will judge. Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Well, notice this. Aquila and Priscilla, let's just read these. I hope that we have time. 
We don't have much to say concerning these verses, so we can read them. Take your Bibles. This couple is mentioned six times in the Bible. And every time we have a glowing report of Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. In Acts 18, beginning in verse 2, notice what it says. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So here Paul seeks them, he introduces, he's introduced to them. He, he again makes their acquaintance, Aquila and Priscilla. Well, look at verse 18. Chapter 18, still in this same context. Look at verse 18. It says, So Paul remained a good while, talking about in Corinth. It says, Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. So here's this couple again, mentioned again, Priscilla and Aquila. Look at verse 26 of Acts 18. This is when they meet Apollos. And they take him aside. They try to instruct him more perfectly. But look at this in verse 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So we see Priscilla and Aquila, husband and wife, mentioned together in every one of those verses. Look at Romans 16. Romans 16 in verse 3, here they come into view again, once again, in a spectacular way. Romans 16 and verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. This couple has made an impact upon Paul. Paul loves this couple. You greet Priscilla and Aquila. Again, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19. Look what the Bible says here. Paul, by inspiration, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. There's this couple again. Paul mentions them. Notice this last place. 2 Timothy the fourth chapter. Notice what we find here. And the reason we're looking at this couple, there are a lot of couples we could have mentioned that give us a bad example. Oh yes, there are other couples we could have cited for a wonderful example. But every time these are mentioned, we find something about them that helps us understand a woman's place. Yeah, it's beside her husband. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 19. Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesephorus. Prissa, Priscilla and Aquila. Again, greet them. Now, what does this one example tell us? Lessons learned? Here's two. Just think about these in closing. Priscilla and Aquila are always mentioned together. They're always with one another. They're always beside one another. A woman's place, Priscilla, where is that? It's beside my husband. You remember Psalm 34 and verse 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. That's what this couple understood. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1 and verse 27. Two are better than one. They realize that. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9. A woman's place, Aquila, where is that? It's beside me. They're always mentioned together. Why? Because they're always together. And lastly, Priscilla and Aquila are always doing the Lord's work. Did you notice that? Whether instructing Apollos on the side, whether the church that meets in their house, wherever it is, they're together and they're always doing the Lord's work. 
They both have the mind of Christ. Remember Philippians 2 and verse 5, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mind of Christ? Luke 2 and verse 49, I must be about my Father's business. These two had the same mind. The same mind as Christ, the same mind of each other. They loved one another. They loved the Lord supremely. They were together involved in His work. Again, a woman's place. Well, if we would just simply stop at behind, we would not be telling the whole story. A woman's place is in subjection. But what does that mean? Again, if you didn't hear the lesson two weeks ago, please, please ask for a copy. Learn about biblical subjection, biblical submission. Again, yes, behind. Priscilla understood that. But yes, beside. Beside. Next week, we're really going to challenge, I think, our hearing, our study, our understanding, because we're going to suggest that there are times that this one whose place is behind and is before, I mean is uh, beside, is also before, before. Talked to an individual just the other day, a wise brother in Christ, and unbeknownst to him, I, he didn't know I was doing this series, but he was indicating what we're talking about, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, about the strength, the encouragement that he has and finds in his wife. Yes, we'd always like to be strong. There are times that we're not. There are times that we help each other. There are times that this one whose place is behind who's always beside, is also before, helping us be the kind of men that we always need to be. Now let me state this also, men, don't think simply because we're going to be looking at the woman's place. Women, we have the men in mind too. We are going to be devising three lessons for us, a man's place. If you have anything that you want us to incorporate in that series or in this one, please write it down and give it to me. We'll do our best to make sure that we state what you have requested. If, if in fact, the big if, if it's biblical, if it's right. What about your life this morning? Your place before God is what we've already said. It is to fear Him. It is to keep his commandments. Are you in your rightful place? Is that what you're doing with your life? If not, that's what you ought to be doing. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. He sent his beloved son that we might be reconciled to him. Ephesians 2 verses 13 and 16. And we can be. That sin that separated us? When we hear the good news, the good news is all about reconciliation. When I hear it and unite it with faith, when I believe the gospel message, when I repent of my sin, when I confess Christ as Lord and Master of my life, when I'm baptized into Christ, that sin that separated me, it's now washed away. It's now remitted. It is forgiven. And I am added by the grace of God to the church of our Lord. Acts 2 and verse 47. And the, the Lord tells me, go work today in my vineyard. Matthew 21 and verse 28. He also says, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Have you done those things? If you've obeyed Christ and his gospel, are you living faithful again? If not, it's time to make some necessary changes. Let's do so right now, today. Don't wait. If you're subject to the invitation of the Christ, if you need to come, won't you do that right now while we stand together and sing?